One of the worst crime scenes I've ever seen in my policing career. Our father, who art in heaven. It went to number one be in name. the charts. Thy kingdom come, thy He done. had a problem on earth with as religion in heaven. I but swear I had nothing to do with this situation. Classes. A disco and version of it. Like, doom, 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 doom. What? <laughs> and was not into temptation. I was beyond us saving from evil. For thine is the kingdom. We have forever. reached the end and spiritually forever. and financially. Amen. And now we go to God. And I just don't want to feel like I am hiding anymore. Our Father, who art in heaven. I just wasn't allowed be thine to be depressed. Kingdom come, thy will be done. Her body earth was laid in. in heaven on the altar. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses too, as we forgive those Welcome who trespass to against us. Extraordinary Stories Podcast the Religion Series. Are you well? Are you good? I am. Okay, so we continue with the religion series, and this is episode two. Not that you would have to have heard episode one. You can listen to them in any order you fancy. (laughs) Whatever tickles your fancy, that's fine. So, in this episode, I'm going to focus on one particular woman. And her relationship with the church, with her own life, her own mental health, and with the world. This is an extraordinary woman with quite the story. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Jean-Paul Deckers was born in Lacken in Brussels in 1933. <laughs> I slightly hesitated, as I said, Lacken, because I'm not from Brussels and I don't know how you say it. But I think it's, I think you would say that, Lacken. I think that's how you would say it. Okay. So yeah, 1933. jean is born. And she's born into a family where her father is a patisserie owner. And she goes through education in a Catholic school in Brussels. So as a young girl, she was outgoing. You know, she was kind of happy. She was just getting on with her life. She was having fun, not too aware of things around her. And then when she hit her sort of teenage years, things started to sort of change for her. She she still had friends and she had a keen interest in attending things like the guides, the brownies, and she had a really keen interest in music. But the thing that was changing in her was she was beginning to feel, as a teenager, quite isolated 
in her life. And she wasn't terribly close to her parents. And she was an only child. And so that isolation is something that would plague Jean as she went through the rest of her life. So the musical interest that she had, it led her to learn the guitar. And she loved it. She absolutely loved playing the guitar. Man, I wish I could play an instrument. But I can't, can't play a thing. I did try piano lessons once. I got really excited. I did that thing, you know, the... um. <laughs> you know the thing that people do when they're like, oh, I'm totally going to get fit and I'm going to go to a gym and I'm going to like, I'm going to suddenly be- run marathons and 5Ks and they like go out and they like buy themselves all the sports gear and they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to buy the best trainers in the world and all that. I basically did the equivalent with piano lessons. <laughs> suddenly I was like one day, hmm, do you know what? I'm going to be the next Beethoven. I've decided it's it's going to happen for me. So I went, like, I bought a piano, right? Well, not like a, like a proper big upright, like a keyboardy one. And I bought all these books off the internet. And I was, like, doing all this, like, teach yourself piano at home. And I was starting to kind of quite like it, right? And I, I thought I was doing quite well. But then I realised I was actually just a bit shit. So then I thought, right, I'll get some lessons. And I found a lovely guy who lived, like, fairly near me, right? And I was, like, went for some lessons. And it was so positive to begin with by about I'm not kidding by about lesson 10 he was about banging his head off the wall because he was like buddy we are still going through the things I taught you in lesson one he was like I could teach an eight-year-old faster than I could teach you how to play piano so I was like well that's fine piano is not for me. That's okay. I'm all right with that. I've moved on in my life. I'm a, I'm a well-adjusted adult. I don't need no piano in my life. <laughs> so, at a young age, Jean was starting to do that thing that kids always do. And they go, what am I going to be when I grow up? What am I going to do? And, you know, she had lots of ideas. She was thinking about pursuing music. And she was thinking about teaching. And somewhere in her head, she was also thinking about becoming a nun. So when the time came to make a decision, it was teaching that she chose. She chose, that's the path I'm going to take. So she entered college to start learning to teach, but she didn't really like it. She got into it and realised it wasn't really her thing, so she left. And in a completely different move, she went to art school. So yeah, fine, okay. It's fine. Go to art school in Brussels. Lovely. Find yourself, explore yourself through that. that that's great. So quite happy doing that. Jean was just having a few relationships here and there. Nothing substantial. She experimented in college like all college students will. And as well as kind of experimenting sexually, she was no stranger to alcohol, to drugs. You know, she kind of dabbled in most things that she could while she was a student. So she dated men, she dated women, and one of the girls that she had met was a woman named Annie. Now, Annie was 11 years older than her, and she would only have been about 18 at the time, making Annie, what, sort of 29, yeah, nearly 30. And I think the situation here is that Annie was slightly more into it than Jean was. But this was art school. This was, this was her bohemian phase. But that only had a limited life for her. She, much like teaching, was getting into it and then went, no, this isn't for me. This just, no, it's not for me. 
So she started to think back and she began to answer for herself the question that she had always wondered about. Should she actually just become a nun? Now when I say just become a nun, I don't mean it like I'm saying, well, you know, I can't seem to find a career, so, well, I guess I'd better become a nun then. I mean, I'm pretty sure <laughs> she wasn't, like, looking around the, the adverts <laughs> section in the paper going, I wonder if there's anything that says nun wanted. When I say just become a nun, it's because it's something that I think Jean had always felt had a real grip on her thoughts, it always kind of niggled away at her somewhere in her brain. And so she finally answered the question for herself and in 1959 she entered the Missionary Dominican Sisters of Our Ladies Church. Snappy, short and snappy. <laughs> when she got in there she was given the name Sister Luke. Gabrielle. Now this is where her life is going to change forever, but maybe not in the way that you imagine. Is she about to disappear into a nunnery and live a quiet life? No way, Jose. She is about to go through some crazy experiences. So having entered the convent, she only took really a few possessions with her. One of them was her precious guitar. So now she's living in the convent. She's adjusting well to that. She thinks that she's made the right choice. This feels right for her. She's like, yes, I've done that whole, I tried to be a teacher, I tried to go to art school, I had various experiences, relationships, but being a nun is the right thing for her right now. So living life as Sister Luke Gabrielle, she gets on really well with all the other nuns, with the lifestyle that it brings, she performs all of her duties really well. And one of the things that she does is she initiates a music group. A sing-along for the nuns, if you will. You know, they'd gather round, she would get her guitar out, and they would sing... Well, I don't know what they would sing. They would... I don't know, maybe a bit of... Madonna, when you call my name, it's like a little prayer down on my knees. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Madonna wasn't around then. But seriously, they would they would sit down, they would sing. And the other nuns loved it. Sister Luke Gabrielle really brought them together and really was able to bring music into that particular convent in a really special, special way. And the Mother Superior, she was really happy to allow the nuns to attend singing groups. I'm, I'm aware, right, <laughs> this story has got like sort of Sister Act vibes hanging over it right now, but believe me, that is not how this story goes. Occasionally when Jean has any free time, she leaves the convent and she meets up with Annie. Do you remember I mentioned her a minute ago? Annie from the experimental phase? Well, they had maintained contact. So, when she's back in her daily routine in the convent, the nuns are all sitting around one day and what they're trying to figure out is... How can they raise enough money to go to Congo and do some missionary work? That's what they really want to do. That's what they really want to go there and 
do some missionary work, but the funds are so low, they have no money, and there's little chance of it happening. Until Sister Luke Gabrielle comes up with an idea. She goes to the Mother Superior and she says, Look, why not let me record an album with some of the other nuns backing singing? And we can take from those sales any money and put it towards the trip, the missionary trip. Now what she's meaning is I could record some things, we could work out how to distribute that amongst other convents, other places, you know, there might be other convents that want to play my music or, you know, I mean, it's a pretty rock and roll idea of her to ask this, but the Mother Superior really likes the idea and she agrees. So, Sister Luke, Gabrielle, she will be the singer. And she pulls together a couple of backup nuns, the <laughs> the Kelly and the Michelle, if you will. <laughs> She's going to be the Beyonce of the act. Now, there's one thing that the Mother Superior insists on, and that is that she protects her name as a nun. And instead of Sister Luke Gabrielle, she becomes... Now, this is where it's all going to go wrong. Su... Sueli... Sueli. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> but, <laughs> translated, Sister Smile. Sister Smile. Okay, so we've known her as Jean Deckers, the happy but isolated teenager and experimental adult... We've known her as Sister Luke, Gabrielle, and now she's Sister Smile, the singing nun. Now, it all goes one step further than just recording some CDs or, well, it wouldn't have been CDs back then, but recording some records and then going out around the convents. What actually happens is, they contact a record company and ask, are they interested in recording her songs? And a record company come forward and they say, yeah, we are. We are interested. Now, the record that she goes on to record for the first album, she writes and she records various different things, but the biggest hit that she will ever have comes from that first album, and it's called Dominique. Now, if you don't know it, I would suggest you pause, <laughs> you type in the singing nun Dominique, and you hear just what that is, okay? I can't play it on the podcast for copyright reasons. I would I would like to try and swing it. I was actually trying to find a way to just kind of like slyly put it in, but I, I've been here before. iTunes, I, they took away, iTunes took away a few of my episodes when I broke the rules before, and I'm not going to make that mistake again. So if you'd rather plow on and listen at the end, imagine, if you will, a high-pitched voice with a guitar and some singing nuns in the background. And it basically, the song just goes, Dominique, Nick, Nick, Dominique, Nick. And then it sings in like French for ages, and then the chorus is, Dominique, Nick, Nick, over and over and over. I mean, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound, oh, that was beautiful, by the way, the way I did that. It's gorgeous. It doesn't sound like something which would appeal to the mass public. A singing nun. But yes, it does. In fact, it appeals so much that the song enters the US Billboard charts. Sister Smile was gaining some massive fame. 
And at first it came from the music press. They were really keen to focus on who was this woman? Who was this singing nun? So other churches around the world, they began playing not only Dominique, the big song, but some of her other things from her album. Then the tabloid press started to become interested. Because what was happening was, the song Dominique was beginning to climb the charts. Now, outside of the US and around the world, the singing nun was becoming a smash hit. The song Dominique was heading for number one in the USA and she was in a chart battle with... (laughs) It's so ridiculous. The Beatles. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's just insane. But what all of this was adding up to is that it was raising money for the convent that she belonged to and the missionary trip that they wanted to go on. Was Sister Smile enjoying her fame? Was... Jean, as we really know her, enjoying all of this. Well, yes, but mainly no. That girl who entered the convent feeling lost, feeling isolated, was suddenly in the limelight and it was all just a bit much. Her photograph was appearing in newspapers, She was being sent letters and gifts from around the world, including, and I love this, direct quote here from the Mother Superior. She was being sent things by men far too explicit for a girl in a convent. Hmm. My guess, dick pics. (laughs) <laughs> well maybe not <laughs> we'll look at that <laughs> but it was having an effect on her because she had entered the, the convent at a time when she felt most isolated from the world and actually now what happened was she'd gone from being in the safety of the security. And I know that she was the one who said, let's record an album and let's do all this, but I just don't think that she ever thought it's going to catapult her into the limelight, where she's literally leaving the convent, you know, to go and do something, and there's press standing outside because they want photographs of the singing nun. That's not what she signed up for, but it's, it's what she was now having to deal with. She said this, I was having a really hard time keeping up my Girl Scout happy-go-lucky face all the time. I just couldn't be happy all of the time. I was never allowed to be depressed. The Mother Superior would go through the song lyrics I wrote and take out anything which reflected me feeling sad. I just wasn't allowed to be depressed. So you've got her feeling like that, but at the same time, she's being forced to give concerts now. She's touring different churches and cities and she's sharing the music. As well as this, she's appearing on national TV shows and it's just exhausting. And it's just going to get worse because Dominique, that song, it goes to number one in the US charts and the pressure it builds. And the more it builds, the more it continues to absolutely drain her of life. But she soldiers on. So after the success of the song, her album is released. 
but the album doesn't really do as well. Although the song had done really well, the album didn't. It, it, kind, of, it kind of vanished. However, in the bigger picture, there was money being made. And in order for that, you know, money to keep coming in, she had to keep this contract with a record company and basically any money that she was making was coming back into the convent. Money in the in the way of one hundred thousand dollars came back into the convent. Now, now is money coming to Jean? No, not a penny. Any money that's being made is being split between the record company and the convent. And she was, for want of a better way to talk <laughs> about a nun, she was being pimped for money. She was being pimped out. I, and I hate to say that, but that, I can't really find another way to say it. She's being pimped. <laughs> and when the heat begins to kind of die down around her and the... The fame starts to fade, you know, the song starts to fall down the charts. It's great for the convent because they've raised all this money. It's great for the record company because they've had this massive hit and they've got this sort of novelty act signed to them. But it's not fucking great for her. She's left as the person who has to now feel all the effects of that. And having not been allowed to display any kind of depression, any kind of negative feeling for so long now, she just starts to unravel bit by bit. And she really feels the effects of the come down from fame. And here she is, she's back in the convent, she's back into her quiet life, and she starts to go into a bit of a depression. What doesn't help here is that she's beginning to clash with all the other nuns. There's a lot of bitterness around the success that she found. There's a lot of people angry that she was able to go and be on TV talk shows and all this sort of stuff that other nuns were annoyed at her about. Her and Mother Superior the one who just does not want to put up with any kind of depression or negative feelings, their relationship really begins to break down. And so this is what the attempt to fix that is. She is sent to study theology at university. She's sent to take a break from her daily duties in the convent and go to university and learn more. Right, so she does that. She's like, fine, okay, I'll do it. She's fit right back in to the student life. And she quite likes it for a while. I mean, it's odd. It's very odd in that situation because really what you have is you have her going to university to study theology, you know, for most of the day and then coming back and living the life of a nun in the evening. So she's never, you know, she's not for a full 24 hours being a nut. You know, she's between these two different places. So she's still living in the convent, you know, she's still there, but she's being allowed to leave and go and study theology. And occasionally, you know, the press are still kind of popping up and trying to take photographs. And then there's like a big, oh, there's a photograph of her standing outside of the university building and she's smoking a cigarette and it becomes like, you know, front page news. Oh, the singing nun smoking a fag. And it's like, oh, come on, you know. And now she's in this really tough place. And I really feel for her here because she wants to be a nun. But she's become something that she herself doesn't even like. And that thing has been created by other people. And she's lost. She's just absolutely lost. So she has difficulty here in, in making a decision, making a choice. 
continue life back in the convent or do something else. Go and just do something else and she is pulled. So she continues with her university studies. She continues to stay in the convent. And it's during this time that the record company come back and say, OK, you're on a contract. You need to release a second album. Get writing. Now, she is not in the mood to write songs. She is not in the place where she wants to do it. But that's the contract, and she has to write something. So she does. It gets recorded, and it sells very little. She's out of the spotlight. No one cares anymore about the singing nun. Eventually she gets to a point where she realises that she actually just wants to leave the convent. She doesn't want to be there anymore. And it's a shame because I don't really think the convent appeared to care greatly because when she says she's going to leave, they don't put up any kind of fight. And having been Sister Smile and Sister Luke Gabrielle, she's now back to being Jeanne Decker. And here she is. She's on her own in the world. So what does she do? Well, she begins to spiral completely out of control. She's got no money. Nearly all of her money was taken by the record company and the convent. And so, well, what now for Sister Smile? Well, alcohol, tranquilizers, and a life with no focus. Jean and Annie had begun a proper relationship and now they had moved into an apartment together. So finally, Lino living with a woman she loved and for the first time in her life, being able to admit and accept that she was gay was the next step for her, but her mental health was not strong. It was... Really, only a year after leaving the convent, she tried again for a hit song. And I think the title of this, although hilarious, it, it does sum up her relationship with the church. <laughs> she released a song called Glory Be to God for the Golden Pill. <clears throat> now... I think releasing a song called Glory Be To God For The Golden Pill in the late 1960s a Catholic nun releasing it it's pretty controversial but you know it was obviously she was making a statement with that you know she wanted to say something with it but it absolutely flopped as a song I mean Pretty sure I could turn it into a hit, but you know, <laughs> it's different times. So she powers on and she releases an album called I'm Not a Star in Heaven. Oh, I think that title's really sad. Hmm. And this album, it bombs. No one wants to hear it anymore. And she blames it on the fact that the record company forced her to use the name Jean Docker and not Sister Smile. She says, well, no one knows who Jean Docker is. You know, they know who Sister Smile is. And in the end, the album ends up costing money. So she's gutted. And, you know, although that she now has the love of her life, Annie, by her side, she's still taking this pretty badly. She still feels in her heart a deep connection to God. And so she's still living parts of her life like 
a nun. And I know this all sounds just like one massive, massive paradox that she's recording songs and trying to make hits and whatever. But in her life, she's still living with Annie, sort of like a nun. You know, she's trying to kind of like keep her connection with God and say her prayers and, and you know, live a very measured lifestyle. But the fact that everything that she tries to have a hit single, to have a hit album, the fact that they fail, they hit her really badly and she just goes into more and more alcohol, more and more tranquilizers, and eventually she suffers a mental breakdown. And for two years, she has to receive psychiatric treatment. I mean, this is a dark, dark time. For her, she can't really see what the future holds. And she's trying, I mean, she is trying to pull herself together. So, her psychiatric treatment finishes and with Annie by her side, she slowly starts to get better. And then something a bit bright happens for her. Jean is approached by the Catholic Charismatic Movement. <laughs> yes, the Catholic Charismatic Movement. And they are a movement within the Catholic Church who believe in using charisma, personality, to spread the word of God. And they ask Jean, would she consider writing songs for them? Sort of like anthems, if you will. You know, like sort of things that they could sing as a big massive group. And so she gets on board with that and she she's quite happy to be doing that. So as she's doing that, her partner Annie has set up a centre for autistic kids. Now this is early 1980s. That's quite progressive, you know, I think. Good on Annie for setting up somewhere for autistic kids. So, you know, maybe they're both kind of getting on the right track. Maybe things are looking quite good. Until more darkness is about to hit Jean's life. She gets a tax bill for $63,000. Now, she does not have that kind of money. She is skint. She's living this really meagre life. But the tax man wants the money. And she's actually threatened with prison if she can't afford to pay. And it becomes this horrible tangled web where she's trying to explain that she doesn't have this amount of money and that actually any money, any earnings were taken by the convent. They were taken by the record company. She never actually physically was ever given a load of cash and said, do what you want with it. She never saw it. So yeah, she might have been number one in the charts and she might have been on national TV Saturday night shows singing her songs. She made no money out of it. So... It becomes an absolute financial mess. So what she does is she tries to make one more comeback. And this time, <laughs> it's a... <laughs> she goes back to her biggest hit, Dominique, and she tries to do a disco version of it. Meant for, like, clubs and, like, radio, you know. It's like a, it's basically the same. It's it's just her with the guitar going, Dominique, and it can make with a doom, 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 doom behind it. <laughs> I mean, I have to be honest. <laughs> I, I don't know a lot of clubs that would be, uh, that would be playing that. I'm not sure that on a Saturday night, I would be running to a dance floor if I heard <laughs> Dominique, the dance version coming on. Anyway, so... She tries this, but it fails. I just feel so... I feel terrible for her, because at this point, 
everything she's trying is failing. And this is the girl who literally went through her life going, I've tried a bit of teaching, didn't really work for me. I've tried a bit of art school, didn't really work for me. I've tried to be a nun, where she sort of maybe found the happiest that she ever was. And she was then, by, by the convent and by other people, turned into something that she never really wanted to become. And now she's the one paying the consequence for it. So the story around the money blowing up, it gets into the press, you know, it's all that big ex-nun and unpaid taxes scandal. And so the outcome is that eventually the church agree they will make it disappear. The debt will be gone if Jean will stop appearing in the press. She doesn't really want to be appearing in the press. That's not really what she wants. She's just worried that she's going to go to prison for money that she can't pay. So absolutely broke. Now, on top of this, her partner Annie's Centre for Autism has to close due to lack of money. And so now you've got these two women. They're sitting bankrupt and they have, and they have no idea what the future holds. So what does it hold? Are Jean and Annie living a quiet life somewhere now? No. The singing nun, Jean Decker, who named one of her albums, I Am Not A Star In Heaven and her partner, Annie, were found dead in their apartment in March 1985. They had overdosed on tranquilizers and alcohol. The joint suicide note indicated that the two women had decided to leave the earth hand in hand, side by side and it instructed that they wanted to be buried side by side. The joint letter which lay next to their dead bodies has never been revealed in full but the opening line of it was this. We have reached the end spiritually and financially and now we go to God. And so ends the story. Okay, right, that was the second story in the religion series. I hope you enjoyed it. I think if you don't know Dominique, <laughs> the big hit, go and listen to it. And also then go and listen to the disco version because it is just brilliant. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying I wouldn't dance to it. I'm not, you know, put it on at a party. I might be getting my, getting my Dominique on, you know, you never know. Um, but yeah, okay. It's a pretty, it's a pretty wild story. It's one of those ones where you know, like I'd always heard, oh, the singing nun, the singing nun, and like you know, you never really like, pay attention to it. And I actually just was looking at that a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, the singing nun, what's that story? I was like, the fuck, it ends in her and her partner killing themselves. Like what? How can you go from like that to you know to that? And it's just yeah. So I found that fascinating to look at. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Okay. So, as always, you know where to get in touch with me. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email. Okay. Hope you enjoyed this second episode. And until the next episode. Okay. Goodbye.
It didn't. It didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.